Initially, you'll think I've lost my mind because while I am going to talk about the Western Delta Intake concept as an alternative to the BDCP, I'm going to take a little while to get there uh, because some of the background uh, is important and not well understood. Uh, I normally start by explaining that I have a slight accent. Uh, that is because, as Barbara mentioned, my undergraduate degree is from the University of Sydney in Australia, where I was born and raised, and then I came to California to go to graduate school. I am now uh, a dual citizen, uh, which means I am licensed to drive on both sides of the road. <laughs> But also, I think in this case, uh, particularly coming from Australia and having worked work on water projects in Australia before I came to California, it might give me not necessarily a better perspective, but a different perspective. Uh, and some ability to look at issues from uh, both sides of the question, just as I can drive on both sides of the road. And that means that uh, as an engineer who likes to solve problems, I am not seeking to choose between uh, farmers and fishermen, uh, not even seeking to choose between almonds and salmon, because I will admit to the fact that I actually drink uh, almond milk as I am lactose intolerant. Uh, but in the broader scheme of things, the salmon uh, have been in these rivers for uh, uh, probably seven, eight thousand years or more. Uh, the salmon and the associated environment that goes with them has been around for a long time and is, is worth preserving. And uh, we can see not overgrowing uh, animals in the desert. I've now given most of my talk already, but I'll launch into the rest of it. Uh, let me just run through these bullets. I'm going to have a short background. Uh, I have more slides than uh, uh, we have time to discuss in detail, so I'm just going to zip through some of the slides. Then I want to take a moment to talk about climate variability. Uh, that's what I was referring to when I said I wanted to take a, line, a long way around to get to the point. Because unless you come to grips with the fact that we live in an area with a variable climate, you really can't come to grips with solving the problems that uh, the Delta and California more broadly face. Uh, then I'll address the question, does the BDCP solve the problem? Uh, you most all probably know already the answer to that, but we'll go through that very quickly. And then I'll finally get to what Barbara was talking about, which is a solution that might solve the problem. Although I want to emphasize the principles on, what, on which it's based more than uh, the details of the solution. Uh, so this is, this, the whole talk is more about principles than details. But if you don't get the principles right, then the details don't matter. And finally, if I haven't completely run out of time and voice, I'll say something about uh, levies because from my last point about conveyance, there's an automatic run into Delta levies. But I'll probably uh, just skip over the slides at that point. So the short background, uh, I'm not going to walk through this uh, uh, slide in detail, but it's a picture of overall water conveyance in California uh, with uh, water conveyance routes that crisscross over each other. And if you had just arrived from Mars or from Australia, which is much the same thing, you, you would be puzzled by not only the water infrastructure in California, but even more by all of the arguments about it. And a rational Martian or even a rational Australian would say, this is amazing, people talking 
uh, at cross purposes, not even beginning to communicate with each other. Uh, one thing that I mentioned uh, briefly that's not shown on this slide is that uh, it omits an important aspect of uh, the Central Valley project, which is a diversion from the Trinity River that actually brings water into the Sacramento or San Joaquin uh, watersheds. Uh, that diversion from the Trinity River is historically very significant. Uh, I won't go into the detail now, but it's those diversions from the Trinity River that were uh, 20 or 30 years overexploited that led to the development of the Westland Water District. And it was the cutbacks in the Central Valley Improvement Act in 1992 that uh, meant that Westlands didn't have such an easy time of it, which is why they have been, uh, in one sense, struggling and in another sense, uh, uh, barking like mad dogs ever since. Uh, they thought they stole that water fair and square. And when uh, the broader community woke up to what was going on and uh, was cut back, uh, that created a genuine problem for Westlands, which had overdeveloped in, uh, in, in their, their fat years. Uh, again, I'm not going to walk through the details of this slide, uh, but all of these slides have been put together in uh, a PDF file, uh, which is available to anyone that wants to look at it. To, go through the slides at their, at their leisure. So that PDF file, I hope, is a useful reference document for a number of people. Uh, things that I point to on this slide, which by the width of the arrows is showing how much water is moved in various directions, is that um, the two really important arrows are uh, this one, that darker blue arrow, which is water diverted at uh, Fryan Dam out of the main San Joaquin Valley into the sub-basin at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, which is really a different drainage. So this water is completely lost uh, to the natural Sacramento-San Joaquin River system. Uh, this big broad arrow here, uh, you can't read this number, but it's like six million acre feet because uh, it's based on uh, water year uh, 2000, which is when exports were running at a pretty good level. Uh, that is the water that's diverted uh, at the South Delta pumps. Uh, some of it ends up going over the Tehachapi Mountains. Uh, it's about 1.5 million acre feet. goes over the mountains to Southern California. Uh, some of it is used in the Central Valley, some of it is diverted to urban communities on the coast, and a lot of it is diverted along with the Fry and Kern water into uh, Kern County. So, uh, uh, people who live in the Delta region, Northern California more generally, are aware that a lot of water is exported, uh, but not necessarily aware of the details of, of where it goes. And this is a good figure to illustrate where it goes. Now coming back to the Delta, this is a picture of the Delta reconstruction of what the Delta was like before 1850, before the discovery of gold. Uh, discovery of gold, one way or another, led to uh, uh, gold miners giving up on gold and settling in the Delta region, starting to farm uh, at first in the face of yearly flooding and then subsequently with the construction of levees on a more permanent basis. Uh, but this was what the Delta looked like originally. It was almost impossible to Western Europeans, uh, but it was very rich uh, uh, in terms of the environment and the ecosystem. So this was a period when salmon runs were in the order of tens of millions, uh, just an unbelievable number of salmon uh, passed through the delta uh, to spawn up in the rivers and then come back on their way to the ocean. As we all know, 
uh, that geography got converted uh, in uh, the second half of the 1800s so that by about 1900, the Delta had been pretty much reclaimed as we know it. The land had been uh, at one time owned by the federal government, sort of by default. Uh, the federal government gave it to the state government uh, under the Swamp and Overflow Lands Act with the condition that the state then set uh, measures in motion which involved setting up local reclamation districts to reclaim the land. And because of that, the state of California has an eternal responsibility for the reclaimed lands of the Delta, however much they deny it. Uh, the state and its official organs, Department of Water Resources, talk about limiting their liability, uh, but in a very fundamental sense, uh, when the state accepted the land from the federal government, they accepted the liability, which in part they have lived up to, in part they have not lived up to. Uh, but even though the geography of the Delta was changed forever and as the blue on this slide indicates, some of it subsided as a result of uh, farming practices uh, which were not the best practices originally, uh, the ecosystem was changed but it was not dramatically damaged. Uh, even after this geometry had been created, uh, through the early part of the 1900s, there were still salmon runs in excess of a million a year. Uh, it was only after the development of the Federal Central uh, Valley Project and the State, State Water Project uh, that salmon numbers and the Delta ecosystem in general started to decline. And uh, the next two slides are uh, representative of uh, the villain here. This is uh, the Delta Cross Channel down in Walnut Grove. Uh, it's just one of three diversions out of the Sacramento River across the Delta. Georgiana Slough and Three Mile Slough also take a lot of water when the South Delta pumps are running. They just suck water from wherever they can get it out of the Sacramento River. Uh, it's sort of a misconception that it all goes through uh, the cross channel because the capacity of the cross channel is only something like 3,000 cubic feet per second, only a fraction of the 11.8 cubic, 1,000 cubic feet per second they can pump in the South Delta. But whether it comes through here or Georgiana Slough or Three Miles Slough, this is where it ends up. This is the state pumping plant. Uh, the federal pumping plant is just uh, out of sight on that uh, canal there. This is the Clifton Court Four Bay. And up to 11.8 thousand cubic feet per second of water are sucked into these two inlets along with a large number of fish. Now, the sucking of the water across the Delta does one good thing, which is with the decline of water quality in the San Joaquin River, it's only the sucking of water across the Delta that keeps Central and South Delta uh, fresh enough for farming. So you can say that's kind of a good thing to remedy uh, a really bad thing, which is the degradation of the San Joaquin River. The two bad things that sucking water across the Delta does, though, uh, one, it just screws up the ecosystem. Uh, the Delta is an estuary that, in which fresh water comes down the rivers and pushes back and forth against uh, salt water that comes in with the tides. That's a very rich environment uh, in which aquatics and other species flourish. And simply dragging the water across the Delta upsets that natural flow path. It also means that physically a large number of fish are sucked into what I euphemistically call the salvage facilities in the South Delta. Uh, more correctly, the salvage facilities should be called sushi factories because most of the fish that are 
sucked into those uh, facilities, either die in the salvage facilities while they're being transported to Antioch, or they're taken by predators when uh, the tank trucks are, uh, are emptied into the Sacramento River uh, near Antioch. Uh, so the mortality rate is very high. Uh, on the way up, I asked my friend Judy how many fish he thought might be uh, trapped in the salvage facilities uh, each year. I gave her the option of 10,000, 100,000, a million, and I think I threw out 10 million. And not unreasonably, well, well I won't say what she said, so little audience participation. Uh, you're not obliged to vote, but these are your options. Uh, 10,000 fish per year, 100,000 fish per year, this is total, all kinds of fish. A million fish per year, or 10 million fish per year. Okay, pretty well informed audience. <laughs> I think you've spoiled the party because now we can't start at the spot. But uh, it is just staggering. Uh, since uh, the biological opinions uh, uh, were introduced around 2005, 2006, those numbers have generally gone back down. But in 2011, uh, there were almost 10 million fish uh, taken in the South Delta salvage facility even with the biological opinions in place. Uh, the world record uh, was set in 2006, I believe, uh, before the biological opinions really started to take effect, where according to the interagency uh, ecological program, 37 million fish were taken. Uh, Peter Moyle, uh, uh, a good guy, one of the good professors at UC Davis, uh, who is like the father of the Delta smelt, uh, says, yeah, but most of those are jackfish. But with all due respect to Peter, they are still part of the overall food web, even though it's jackfish serve as food for someone else in uh, the system, including the salmon and the stripers, which uh, uh, a lot of both uh, recreational commercial fishermen uh, appreciate it. So this is a big issue and uh, I go into this level of detail partly to say that uh, I have uh, friends, uh, I have generally good relations with three or four environmental organizations who are all lobbying for what they call responsible exports plan or originally it was reduced exports plan, but then they got some PR advice and changed it to responsible exports plan. And they want to limit exports of water to three million acre feet a year, which is about half of what was the norm before the biological opinions kicked in and is really what the contractors want. Uh, and later on I'll get to discussing whether or not what the contract is one is reasonable or not, but, but if you can take uh, 10 million uh, fish uh, when you're sucking uh, 6 million uh, acre feet of water out, even if you cut that in half to 3 million acre feet of exports, you're still taking uh, maybe uh, five million, some million, not millions of uh, fish. So uh, all of the, the more scientific people in the fish agencies, both California Wildlife and the Federal Fish Agency say uh, the South Delta pumps are simply not a good idea. And even though you can limit the damage by uh, imposing uh, restrictions on when uh, the contractors are allowed to pump. Uh, you, you can't eliminate the damage that's done to the ecosystem as long as the pumps are in the South Delta. Fish salvage facilities are not fish streams in the normal sense. They're salvage facilities, they're louvers that help divert the fish into holding tanks. Uh, any kind of fish screen 
could not really be effective in the South Delta because the water is sucked straight into them. To be effective, a fish screen has to be uh, set alongside the river, like BDCP proposes up here. Uh, the problem with the BDCP proposed fish screen is that they are simply too long in terms of impacting the environment and because of the amount of water they want to take out, uh, some people question the efficacy of even these screens which are properly oriented, that is, parallel to the flow of the river. Uh, the people who go into this subject in detail talk about the need for sweeping velocities. So you want to have good flow going past the fish stream that you take the water out of parallel to the flow of the river. And that is simply not possible in the South Delta. So even if you improve the salvage facilities, which is impossible, it's still not a very good solution. Tom, have the same problem? Uh, the BDCB tunnels would have less of a problem in directly harming fish because they will have proper screens, but there are a lot of buts. Uh, one of the buts is the BDC thing as it is shaken out only takes half of its water from the North Delta, half of the water would still be taken through the South Delta facilities. So BDCP doesn't solve this problem. Uh, half of the water on the BDCP uh, is much water as the environmental organizations want from their reduced delta exports would still be taken out of the South Delta. And that's still several million fish a year being sucked into the salvage facility. And there are other problems with the BBCP fish screen. So uh, basically, uh, they make some attempt to address the problem, but they don't do it very successfully. Let, let me push on and we, we can come back at another point at the end. So uh, I'll read off this particular slide because uh, I haven't memorized all the words myself. This, this current situation uh, leads to cross flows through the delta, reverse flows in Old and Middle River, fish being sucked into the pumps, and conversion of what's supposed to be an estuary, or what was an estuary, into a weedy lake. Uh, the fact that we don't have good flow through the delta is why we have invasive species. Not only uh, invasive aquatic species like mussels and clams, but also the Brazilian water weed and even the, the, uh, the hyacinth. Uh, Tribal recreational commercial fishing, especially of salmon, is much diminished from historic levels. Arbitrary limits on pumping from the South Delta, uh, which are well-intentioned, drive the boys from Westlands nuts. That's a little pun if you're still awake at this point in the evening. Uh, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the boys from Westlands, but what drives them nuts is that uh, when the fish agency sort of finally caught up with them, uh, they imposed fairly strict limits, like a limit of 300 and something delta smelt per year being taken in the salvage facilities. By any measure, that is an arbitrary limit, especially when delta smelt seem to have moved more to the cash slough area, uh, where the delta smelt population as a whole is now doing fairly well. And in fact, Delta Smelt are even living year-round in the Cache Slough area and surviving for two years, whereas normally they only have a life of one year. Uh, so, uh, Westerns have a minor point that what, that what they've been stuck with is arbitrary, uh, but that is no excuse in my book for going nuts about it. Uh, Meanwhile, South Delta and export water quality are poor, and the Metropolitan Water District wants better water for blending. Uh, metropolitan water is that arrow on the previous slide that goes over the Tehachapi's, 1.5 million acre feet a year. All goes to urban use in Southern California. 
It's all blended with water from the Colorado River, which is very salty. And it's critical to the survival of the Metropolitan Water District as a wholesaler and power broker that they get good quality water to mix with uh, the salty water that they're stuck with from the Colorado River. As Melinda Terry, who uh, many of you might know, uh, said when she first went to a big uh, meeting of the water lords, she realized that the fights about water in California are not about water, they're about power. And I don't mean electric power, they're about, about political power. And Metropolitan's political power, which is very significant, uh, they have the most effective, most powerful lobbyists in Sacramento, uh, is presently directed towards one thing, uh, which is securing better water quality, and that's why they basically want to steal your water at the top end of the delta rather than take it out of the south delta. The, the original plan, of course, was to completely isolate the conveyance. They didn't want to split divergence from North Delta and South Delta. They wanted to take it all from the North Delta. But as BDCP got into it by like 2010, it was apparent that that was never going to work uh, because even with fish screens, they couldn't protect uh, the fish passing through the North Delta, which is why BDCP has ended up as this compromise of half from the North Delta, half from the South Delta, that really doesn't make anyone happy. Uh, so that's the, the final point on this slide. No one is particularly happy. Uh, just a point on the politics. This is a little cartoon that I had made up, but it was prompted by a, a blog by John Lawrence, a guy who now lives in Washington, D.C., who was longtime staffer for George Miller and then Nancy Pelosi. And John Lawrence uh, wrote a blog several months ago that made the point that if you farm on cheap land in a desert, which is what, for instance, happens in Westlands and much of Kern County, and you can get cheap water, and then you go to a crop like Ammons that is quite profitable, it is profitable enough to spin off a lot of money for paying lawyers, lobbyists, and because I like alliteration, I said low-life politicians. <laughs> Not all politicians are low-life. Uh, 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 there are some good ones, like Lois Walk and John Garamendi and others. Um, uh, but low-life politicians particularly like the money that comes from uh, fat cats that are spreading it around to lawyers and lobbyists. Uh, one of my live lawyer friends took, I think, joking offense at this cartoon. And I said, no, that doesn't refer to you. The lawyers in question here are people like Jeff Keitlinger, the general manager of Metropolitan Water District, and Tom Birmingham, general manager of Westland's Water District. These water districts in California used to be run by engineers. I am a little bit biased being an engineer, but it's a sign of the times that they're now run by lawyers that draw salaries of like $400,000 a year. Uh, and so that is what you folks are up against. Uh, you're up against very well-funded, powerful organizations because uh, they take advantage of what I call the, the new hydrological cycle. The hydrological cycle is a technical term that has to do with clouds and rain and so on, but this is the modern version of it. Water and money circulating around, and so there is this common saying now that, that, that water in California doesn't flow downhill, it flows to money. So, now we get into, uh, you're doing pretty well in terms of attentiveness, but here comes the challenging part. Uh, this is the, the more heavy scientific part. Well, it's, it, it's a combination of engineering and science, but I'm going to end up with some real science. 
Um, I'm trained more as an engineer, but part of my engineering training involves substantial training in science. And it really uh, frosts me, to use a more delicate term, that people like uh, members of the Delta Stewardship Council are always talking about good science. We have to follow good science. When uh, they, don't, they wouldn't know good science from a hole in the ground. That, that's a soils engineer's expression. Uh, so there is good science, there is show science, and there is not such good science. So I'm not going to get into bashing uh, what I think is poor science, but I do want to run through a little bit of what I think is good science and good gathering and use of data. Uh, the first two slides are just a more sort of engineering collection of data. Uh, this is data that's available from Department of Water Resources website. Uh, it shows um, uh, precipitation at a average precipitation and well, actually total, I think all sums up. No, I go back to average over eight stations in Northern California. And remember, again, this is my little spiel about climate variability. So, you probably can't read this, but this is inches. Up here is 70, 80 inches a year. Uh, the record is like 90 inches of precipitation a year in the watershed. Down here we have 10 or 15. That is a very broad range. Uh, in the middle here, I just picked this one out because it shows uh, three years ago, 2011, 2012, uh, uh, is, whoops, I think my battery is running low. Uh, So that line there, 2011-2012, shows that precipitation was a little bit below average. Not that much, though. The press talk about the three-year drought, uh, not really true. We had two years of just below average uh, precipitation, and then one year of much below. But even that is an oversimplification. What's really happened is that uh, At that point, which is just before Christmas, uh, a little over a year ago, uh, we had very heavy rains and suddenly the rains came to a halt. And for 13 months, because of a particular climatic condition, thank you, um, that no longer exists. Um, uh, we, we got essentially no rain for that period of time through the end of, of that water year and the beginning of the next water year, which is here. So until the end of January this year, we had very little precipitation over a 30-month period. That is similar to uh, a very dry period that we had in 1976-77. Uh, both of them caused uh, by the same thing, an unusual ridge in the North Pacific. Uh, no one knows exactly why that unusual ridge of high pressure forms in the North Pacific, but thanks to Lynn Ingram, a professor of geography at UC Berkeley, I now know that in 1976-77, that very dry spell coincided with something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I warned you this was going to be esoteric. <laughs> it flipped from its negative side to its positive side. What that means is that in general, the North Pacific Ocean was warming up. And this change from a cooler North Pacific Ocean to a warmer North Pacific Ocean was associated with that unusually dry spell of weather. And 
I've been wondering for some months whether the same thing uh, has just happened again uh, because the value of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation is not widely reported. It's calculated by one professor at the University of Washington uh, and he updates his website every couple of months when he gets around to it. Uh, but I went to it the other day and lo and behold, if the, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation had been negative basically since about 2000, although it had flipped positive in 2005, then went back negative again, uh, was steadily negative until Christmas, uh, this last Christmas. In January, the PDO turned positive. And it's now, in, well, his last measurement was, I think, in April, and it's as positive as it ever gets. What's the significance of this? Uh, it's partly a little personal contest for me because uh, the hand weaving professors from UC Davis, Jay Lund and Jeff Mount earlier this week wrote a blog saying uh, we can't rely on there being good rain next winter because they always go for the doomsday scenario. And they had some simple-minded statistical analysis, but they had nothing about climate patterns in it. And so they correctly said that hope is not a strategy. That is true. You can't, you can't plan just based on the hope that there might be heavier rains next winter. Uh, but uh, the signs are that there will be at least a modest El Nino this next winter coupled with a positive, this magical PDO thing. And historically, that has led to uh, heavier than normal precipitation. Uh, so, unless you've read my comment on uh, the California Water Blog or my similar comment on the KQED website, you heard it here first that based on what we know about climate patterns, there is a reasonable expectation for a wetter than normal wet winter next uh, winter. I've gone into that in some detail because I think that means that the dreaded barriers uh, are history. Uh, DWR have said that, I mean, DWR got egg on their face for going off prematurely uh, without having looked into the barrier question this year and it looks like they've missed their chance. So now I'm going to move through the rest of climate variability as quickly as I can. Uh, that's just a plot from Australia showing the uh, Murray Darling Basin. Uh, all that uh, I think the trick with the pointer is that it shows better on dark uh, items than it does on light items. Uh, but you can see in uh, this part of southeast Australia. There are bunches of wet years and bunches of dry years. That's because their climate is like California's. They sit between a reliably wet area and a desert. Same thing in California. We sit between reliably wet Oregon and Washington and the deserts of Southern California, Southern Nevada, New Mexico. And if you, if you are located in an intermediate area like this, it should be a surprise that, that you get some wet years and some dry years. What's interesting and underappreciated is that the wet years tend to come in bunches as a result of interactions of these oscillations like the PDO and the El Nino. Uh, and then in between you tend to have dry years. And in California, even though the engineers of the 1950s and 1960s didn't do such a bad job for their time, one of their failings was that they failed to appreciate this variability in climate. And all of their projections are in terms of averages. And people still talk in terms of averages. I was talking in terms of uh, not averages, but individual year exports of six million acre feet per year. People have got away from get away from talking about averages 
uh, if we're going to come to grips with the problem. Can, now, can you talk about whether, whether it's snowfall or, or rain? Uh, in one sense, it doesn't matter. As you probably all know, snowfall is good because it's kind of like a reservoir. Uh, there are some forward predictions that snowfall in California is going to decrease, we're going to get more rain. Uh, I don't want to get into that. Uh, that would be a whole other evening to talk about these forward predictions. But what I'm going to show you is the past history, because you really have to understand the past history and, and construct models that are capable of explaining that before you make the forward projection. So, uh, but just to tie up your question, I don't think the snow versus water issue is the most important issue. It's sort of almost in the noise of the problem. Uh, the big, uh, uh, it is a time issue, but that's still uh, a minor part of the problem rather than a major part of the problem. The major part of the problem is that in the early part of uh, this century, because this is about 100 years, the 1900s, in the early part of the century, even in dry years, even in the 1928-30 foot drought, uh, the green here is water that passes through the delta and goes to the ocean, which is critical to the health of the estuary and the ecosystem. Uh, it was only uh, towards the end of the century that combination of upstream diversions, this sort of mauve color, uh, and south delta exports, the yellow and the red, uh, grew to such a level that in the dry spells uh, the delta was kind of sucked dry. And that is the crux of the problem. There, is, there might be enough water to go around if we manage it better. There's enough water in the wet periods, but there clearly isn't enough water in the dry periods for things to go on as, as they exist at present. Uh, because a dry period like that or uh, this uh, plot starts at 2005. Uh, 2005 to 2010 was generally very dry, and that's when uh, the aquatic ecosystem was decimated and the invasive species really start taking over in the delta. Uh, one point to note about this slide, though, is that under our current system, in the very wet years, like uh, 1983, and 1998, which both cases are the second year of an El Nino, the second very wet winter, exports are lower than usual because there's nowhere to put the water. So this is where the guy from Mars who has little ears that look like this, or the guy from Australia that has ears that look like this, I uh, said, what's wrong with this picture? Shouldn't we somehow be taking more water in wet years and storing it for use in dry years? Uh, and if we don't do that, uh, the problem will not be solved. Uh, so uh, that point is repeated on the very next slide, but before I go to the very next slide, I want to sort of ask the question, you see this pattern over a hundred years, bunches of wet years, bunches of dry years. How long have we had that? How long is it likely to continue? This does raise the forward prediction issue. Uh, uh, is this pattern likely to continue? Well, in order to address that, we ought to look back. Maybe a thousand years initially, uh, then 10,000 years go back, look back even a million years. Uh, but even before we look back a thousand years, uh, this slide misses an important thing that happened in 1861-62, which is that uh, the precipitation was so great, mostly as rain, that the Central Valley was entirely flooded. 
and California's nascent cattle industry was wiped out. Not only was the Central Valley flooded, but there were sheets of standing water in the Mojave Desert, the Los Angeles Basin, and the Imperial Valley. So uh, that happened 160 years ago. Uh, it might reasonably happen again, has implications for the flood management system, which would be uh, tested by, by such an event. Um, but it also has implications for water conveyance and storage, because in the recurrence of an event like that, uh, there would be nowhere to put the water. Uh, and just to repeat myself, the present system just doesn't accommodate events like that. Now, uh, this slide is a little bit blurry. It's just scanned from a Scientific American article by Lynn Ingram from UC Berkeley and Mike Deginger from USGS. Uh, when you see press reports and articles in Scientific American that are kind of showy, you should probably take them with a grain of salt because they're looking for a more popular audience. Uh, and so I approached this with a grain of salt and discovered that it was very good work. This is good science that combines the results of studies of uh, sediment cores, tree rings, and archaeology. Three different lines of evidence that show patterns of flooding and drought going back over a thousand years. And basically they concluded that you get these, what they call mega floods, about every 200 years. There were a couple of gaps here and here uh, because going back to medieval times, we actually had a long drought period. That's shown on this slide. Uh, so this now goes back uh, 3,000 years. So uh, the 100 years of my first bar graph is just in this little blob up here. Uh, if you go back over a, over a thousand years, which goes back to there, you can see we go back to a period, this is actually sh showing sea surface temperature in the Atlantic Ocean, but that is a good measure of worldwide climate and also uh, uh, the size of the ice cap and all these things that are tied together. And uh, I asked the question, is this variation we've seen over the last hundred years going to last, is it significant? Well, on this time scale, it looks to me as though it will last at least for another 50 to 100 years. But if you go out a thousand years, it may not last. Because if we go back a thousand years or 3,000 years, we've had much bigger swings. So, uh, uh, it's people who talk about climate change and sea level rising um, have some reason for doing that. Uh, but it's actually small potatoes if you look at the overall history. And if you go back uh, 24,000 years, you actually capture the rise in sea level from uh, the last ice age. At the last ice age, the peak of the last ice age, sea level was down 300 feet, not just at San Francisco Bay, but worldwide. And so uh, the last 8,000 years, which is from here to here, have been relatively stable. That's the period over which the delta has formed, with sea level being going up and down some, but being relatively constant. That is what has allowed the accumulation of peat in the delta. So that by, by world history standards, we're in a period of relatively constant climate. But within that relatively constant period, we still have these bunches of wet years and bunches of dry years, with ranging from 90 inches of precipitation in Northern California down to 10 or 15. This is the very last slide in this section. This is just to show you how things vary if you go back, not even a million years, this is just 500,000 years. Uh, 
this would be new to members of the Dallas Church Council, to almost everyone involved in the debate over climate change. But this is elementary quaternary geology. Uh, and so Barbara kindly said that I had a minor in environmental planning, which is correct. But I'm about a quarter a quaternary geologist, and this is just basic stuff to geologists that in the last 500,000 years there have been four or five ice ages with these very large fluctuations in, in uh, climate and temperature. Uh, back to home. Uh, I'm just repeating uh, this picture of the last hundred years to set up the next slide, which actually shows salmon returns. But uh, note these, uh, that bump, that bump, and that bump. There are these three big bumps of, of a series of weather and normal winters. Lo and behold, if that doesn't correspond to better salmon runs. Uh, this is the figure taken from an EPA report. I uh, won't go into the detail, but just note that correspondence. That more water flowing through the estuary seems to be good for salmon and presumably other fish. So, all of this, uh, we're now getting to the meat of the subject. All of this leads to two basic principles. Uh, the only solution to current problems, not just your problems, but everyone's problems, requires following these two basic principles. This is like the golden rule, rule for water in California. Allow natural flows to pass through the element before any surplus is extracted for export. And extract more water during periods of high flow, less or no water during periods of low flow. We could actually add a, uh, a third one, which really is the golden rule, which is uh, respect your neighbors and be civil to everyone. That is really a challenge in our current environment, but that is something we have to w work towards, which is better communication. So, uh -oh. Yeah, just getting into that now. Because uh, with the high flow, you get uh, you get the turf, a lot of uh, uh, contamination, they, and they don't like it that way. They don't like to go through the pump with dirt. Uh, yes and no. Uh, you get more turbidity. Right. Uh, which is actually favorable to aquatic species like the Delta Snow. Uh, not necessarily for the pumps, but uh, when we get to my suggested alternative, uh, there is a mechanism for dealing with the fact that you get more turbid water at periods of high flow. Uh, and so I'll be, I'll be getting to that in just a moment. Uh, so, uh, uh, just a few slides on uh, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, because I'm assuming everyone's pretty familiar with it. Uh, does it comply with these two principles? Uh, no, it doesn't. Uh, the BDCB is driven by two other uh, factors, I hesitate to call them principles. One I've already, well, both of them I've already mentioned. But these, it's really important to understand that this is what drives the Metropolitan Water District in Westmont. Metropolitan is driven by a quest for better quality water, for blending with their salty water. They don't talk about that much. They talk about failing levees and so on, but that is what they really want. That is why they want to come to the North Delta. And uh, the second thing that drives BDCP is that the agricultural contractors don't, they benefit a little bit from better quality water, but it's not so critical to them. The agricultural contractors don't get very much out of BDCP, which is why people seriously doubt whether they'll pony up the money for it. But Westlands gets at least some relief from their pet peeve which is restrictions on take of Delta Snow, limiting their ability to fill up San Luis Reservoir. Now, I think they exaggerate that, but there is some merit to their argument. 
Uh, and I already said I think there is some merit to their argument that the, that the limit on taking Delta's smell is arbitrary. They don't get much sympathy from me, but but I do understand why they get so mad about this. Uh, this is just a standard plot of uh, the current alignment of the BDCP. Uh, I won't go into all of its shortcomings. Uh, uh, there is this obvious shortcoming that there are three enormous intakes up in this uh, rather attractive stretch of the river that Judy and I just drove up, um, uh, which, which, as I frequently say, would be decimated by the construction of those intakes. Uh, so that's a compelling argument against BDCP from the point of view in this area. Uh, but even broader argument is that it doesn't comply with uh, my two principles, so therefore it won't work long term. Uh, I don't know whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, but it has been so badly managed for the last seven years, the, uh, I've lost count. Is it $250 million they've spent on it now? Uh, uh, I suppose from the point of view of some, it's good that it's been misspent. Uh, but from the point of view of uh, uh, fiscal responsibility, the program has just been terribly badly managed and is to this day. I have actually read large portions of uh, the draft EIRIS, and um, I guess I've written it that it's a dog's breakfast. I'm not sure if people understand that. I think it's an Australian expression. Dog lovers seem to get the, get upset by that. But, uh, someone said it's more like what the dog produces after it's eaten breakfast. Uh, but anyway, the, the current documents are a mess, with whatever way you look at it. Uh, so it's unlikely that they'll be able to quickly finalize that EIR. Uh, I don't know what the governor is going to do, but I think after his secured re-election, there'll be yet another rethink. Well, I think uh, you could call the devil the dog. Yeah, you could. <laughs> uh, the, now, the BCP is a legacy idea. It's a revamp of the peripheral canal. Uh, when the biological opinions were issued in 2005 or something, uh, Westland got so upset that they joined with Metropolitan Water District, they decided to push for an isolated conveyance from the North Delta. They tried to sell that to Delta Vision. To their credit, Delta Vision, which wasn't such a bad operation, uh, refused to buy into the isolated conveyance, went with what is called dual conveyance, and that sort of defeated the purpose of the contractors. The canal, the 1982 canal, uh, and its predecessors, what led up to the 1982 canal, assumed not only diversions from the Trinity River that I mentioned earlier, but it assumed additional diversions of up to 5 million acre feet from the northern rivers. Jerry Merrill, the same uh, comical Jerry Merrill that we've, that we've uh, suffered with the last three years, uh, and Jerry Brown, our uh, beloved governor, in 1982, or even earlier, starting in 1980, gave up on the diversions from the Northern Rivers in order to try to buy off the Sierra Club in the fight over the peripheral canal thereby shooting themselves in the foot. That kind of diversion from the North Delta doesn't work unless you have the diversions from the Northern Rivers. Those diversions would have decimated the Northern Rivers, so it's a good thing they were given up. Uh, but it also means that the idea of an isolated conveyance from the North Delta no longer worked. Uh, but regardless of that, the contractors, the exporters, still think they have the political muscle to push it through. 
Uh, although I think their fate, their hopes are better than their failure. Uh, will the BBCP ever work? No. Uh, low flow through the delta is not better than cross flow. I already explained that cross flow is screwing up the natural system. You replace cross flow with low flow, it's no better. BDCP contains no storage for various political reasons, therefore includes no mechanism for taking more water in wet years to make up for taking less water in dry years. Uh, Jerry Merrill and uh, now I think Carl Nemeth, uh, and their PR people talk about it does take, satisfy the big goal, little sip principle, uh, but that is basically a lie. That, that's just PR talk. There's no mechanism in the BDCP for taking a bulk big gulp. And in fact, in the driest months and dry years, they plan to take more water than is taken at present. I think that's covered in my uh, comments on the BDCP, uh, EIS, and uh, Richard Denton and others will cover that for Contra, Costa County and others in their comments. Uh, it still leaves the exporters vulnerable to a six-year drought, just as we could get mega floods that are worse than we've seen in the last hundred years. We could get droughts equal or worse than the two almost six-year droughts we had in the last century. Uh, BECB makes no provision for that. And as Jeff Michael has uh, uh, really, and spoken a number of times, the true benefit cost ratio is about uh, point, point 0.4. It's not a very good financial investment. Uh, Jeff Michael from University of Pacific gave a very good presentation to Solano County Board of Supervisors a week or two ago that I think Gene uh, videoed and wrote up on Central Valley Business Times and I recommend that to all of you. Is there an alternative that will work? Yes, but new thinking is required. Uh, uh, new thinking is not necessarily required to solve every problem in the world. There are some problems that don't require new and different thinking. Being new and different it's not intrinsically valuable unless what's being done at present is not working. If what's being done at present isn't working, then new and different thinking might be required. But one of the big faults of BDCP and of their EIR, EIS, which is required to look at alternatives, is that they consciously ran away from any innovative alternatives. And to the extent they included them in appendices of uh, the existing document, they were um, they gave them short shrift, which is <laughs> pretty impolite, uh, which is stupid from their point of view. Uh, what they put in that document is so open to criticism uh, that they don't have a very good basis for going forward. Uh, now. Part of the reason I'm, trying to, I'm going to keep the next bit as short as I can uh, is that there is now a much longer explanation on this website. I don't know if you can all remember this, but fixcawater.com is a website uh, that was started uh, by a guy called Brian Caples who lives up in Roseville, uh, which he sort of donated to me uh, for constructing not only the argument for the Western Delta Intakes concept, but what is the background, only part of which I've gone into tonight. So it now has quite a long treatment of climate variability, uh, which uh, is as good a treatment of climate variability that you will see outside of Lynn Ingram's work from UC Berkeley. And hers only goes back like a thousand years. Whereas the treatment on this website uh, goes 
goes back a lot further than that. Uh, and it's not my work. It's All I've done is collect what is standard uh, quaternary geology, uh, is standard teaching in geology departments throughout this country and the world. So, uh, finally, you're all saying, finally he gets to it. Barbara is smiling and Tim is saying, it's that time. <laughs> uh, I forgot to give Tim uh, credit earlier for my photographs of the Cross Channel and uh, uh, Clifton Court Corvey. They were taken from his, uh, his plane. That's the strut of his Cessna that you can see in all my photographs. Uh, it's a very good way to actually get a feel for the dog to fly over it. And we in fact flew around Sherman Island that day. So, uh, I won't go into exactly how I came up with the details of this alternative, but the big thing is, uh, after working intensively on the review of EDCP uh, for a year informally and for about a month in a formal sense, uh, before I was uh, kicked out of that role by the staff of the Delta Stewardship Council, which is another story, uh, I had concluded that BDCP would never work, uh, and that a solution needed to comply with these two principles. And then, uh, in the next month when I was unemployed, uh, sitting with my feet on the desk, uh, thanks partly to a conversation with Jonas Minton of PCL, a light bulb went off and I said, ah, the solution is take the water out of Sherman Island. Because that's the last possible point before the water becomes more salty. And that way you're actually taking out water which is supposed to be surplus to Northern California needs, not at the beginning of the delta, but at the end of the delta, it's just a, like a common sense point to take it out. And then uh, uh, Jonas had said to me when I was arguing for we don't we need the ability to take out not less than 15,000 cubic feet per second, but more than that in wet wet, wet years. He said, I understand that, but who would hold the key to the pumps? And I said, you can hold the key, Jonas. And Jonas laughed and said, uh, no, the contractors would never agree to that, which is correct. I checked with the contractors. They said, no, we wouldn't agree Jonas holding the key because they don't like anyone holding the key other than themselves. Um, and when the light bulb went off, it was that if you take the water out of Sherman Island, you can't take out too much water. It is self-regulating. And uh, that was sort of a simple click of a light bulb in my head. Uh, I've been really gratified to see how that resonates with such a wide range of people, from people whose political views I know are sort of right-wing to people whose political views I know are sort of left-wing. Um, without fail, everyone that is made aware of this idea says, hey, that's a great idea, that it's self-regulated. Um, and uh, I'll just run through a little bit of detail. What this scheme would involve is taking out water at Sherman Island up to 15,000 cubic feet per second when there are periods of high flows. Um, the next slide I'll explain how we take the water out. Uh, with minimal impact on the fish that are passing because this is a critical location for passage of both salmon and delta smell. Uh, so if you're going to take out the water there, it has a lot of advantages, possible disadvantages, but it's very sensitive area for fish, so you've got to deal with that. Uh, then you move the water in uh, tunnels, probably two tunnels, uh, for various engineering reasons, down to the vicinity of the Clifton Court Corbay. Uh, but those tunnels are half the distance of the BDCP tunnels. Uh, they're in good ground for tunneling uh, in an area where 
the community might support it uh, because of uh, uh, the construction spending that would be taking place in their, their district. Uh, the first person I ever talked about this, well, the second person was Mary Pifo, whose district this is in. So if you come up with a harebrained idea like this, it's important not to rush selling it. You have to go uh, be civil to as many people as you can that might be impacted by it. And I've done at least some of that, but still need to do more of it. In very wet years, like 1997, when there's a lot of flow in the uh, San Joaquin River, uh, so the contaminants are uh, largely diluted, a lot of flow coming down the old river. In fact, you could pump simultaneously from Sherman Island and the South Delta and get up to a maximum of 30,000 cubic feet per second. This is the kind of big gulp that you need if you're going to take out 8 to 10 million acre feet a year in a very wet year so that you have 2 to 4 million acre feet that you can use to replenish the groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley, which at present is on its way to China, where it's going to meet up with the almonds that they export to China. And so, uh, Westlands and other people are driving themselves out of business, planting permanent crops. They have to pump deeper and deeper in dry periods. It makes sense that they pump in dry periods. What doesn't make any sense is that, uh, that forever they talk about recharging water, uh, the aquifers in wet periods, but they never do it. Uh, if if you're actually taking out 30,000 cubic feet per second total, you can't move all of that in the aqueduct cell. So you have to store some of it locally, which is what these big blue dots are. Down the bottom there's an important arrow. Uh, there's no problem in very wet periods, but in dry years when we're taking water out of Sherman Island only, uh, Central and South Delta water quality would go down <coughs> without these cross flows that come across the Delta. So in those periods, we would have to take water out of the aqueducts and recirculate it into the San Joaquin River as much as 2,000 cubic feet per second. Unless someone else comes up with a solution to the problems of the San Joaquin River, which means diverting less water at the front dam or really cleaning up the agricultural wastewater. But neither of those two things is going to happen very soon, which is why in this plan uh, I make provision for recirculating water into the San Joaquin River. So all of that makes sense, I think, from everyone's point of view. Uh, thank you. The water quality for export for Metropolitan Water District would be not as good as it would be from the North Delta, but it would be better than they want, better than what they did at present from the South Delta. So uh, even though they've been reluctant to sign on to this alternative, it would be an acceptable deal for Metropolitan Water District. It's a very good deal for the agricultural contractors because they would get more reliable water. It would actually make something like their present operation sustainable. If not at their existing level, at something like their existing level. But only if they're willing to invest uh, significant money in constructing these facilities and they're willing to invest money into the groundwater recharge, which is not really a big ticket item. That could be done. Uh, but they have to get serious about doing it, which they never be. So, uh, rather oddly, the biggest critics of uh, this uh, concept which is just a concept based on two principles that are firm, but the concept 
uh, while it has enough detail to understand it, is not final in every detail. Uh, the biggest critics are, uh, have been uh, uh, folks who've said that this is going to upset the fisheries, uh, which is basically nonsense. The same people uh, want to continue taking water from uh, South Delta intakes that I previously explained are going to continue to uh, chop uh, millions of uh, fish a year into sushi uh, or drop them as dead fish into the Sacramento River and empty up where they're taken by predators. Uh, regardless of how much you can improve those fish salvage facilities. So my polite suggestion is that this alternative instead of taking millions of fish, would take no fish, zero fish. Uh, it, would take, it would take some fish food, uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton, uh, small enough that they would get through these permeable embankments, embankments that are uh, constructed out of sand, which would be the world's biggest fish greens. Uh, but that's true of any exported water. It takes it takes fish food with them. And part of this scheme is that uh, we would actually dredge out the peat from part of Sherman Island that's used as an intake for bait and settling pond to get rid of some of the uh, sediment and use it to create tidal marsh to the west, which is exactly where the tidal marsh should be. Uh, the, uh, one, of, one of the big areas of support for that comes from Carl Wilcox at California Fish and Game, who made exactly that point in the presentation of the symposium at UC Davis. And, and Carl used the extreme western end of Sherman Island as his example of the design of good habitat. In contrast to all of this habitat in BDCP, which is located in areas of about zero elevation because they think it's cheaper to construct. It might be cheaper to construct, but all of the fish food experts uh, say it doesn't work. The food doesn't go to fish. You have to put the fish fairly close to where the, the fish, fish are. Uh, so this is a basic misunderstanding of the entire BDCP concept. Uh, it's one of the reasons they can't get an effects analysis, a prediction of the effects on aquatic species that works because their supplemental food sources are in the wrong place. Uh, this alternative would have supplemental food sources for fish in the right place and uh, it would basically take zero fish because the smallest, uh, the largest pore size uh, in the sand embankment is too small and the approach velocities uh, are a hundred or a thousand times smaller than the approach velocities that uh, the fish agencies allow for the design of fish screens. They have numbers which are a bit arbitrary. They're like 0.2 feet per second is the greatest velocity that you're out to have going into the fish screen. That's why the BDCP fish screens here have to run almost continuously uh, from one intake to another. They have to be so large in order to keep those intake velocities down. The intake velocities of these embankments on Sherman Island would be a hundred or a thousand times lower. Uh, so uh, the BDCP EIR in their appendix, which sort of dismissed this alternative, was at least gracious enough to say that this was a good idea. Then they said it won't work because your calculation is wrong. Uh, but with all due respect, their calculation is wrong. <laughs> and if you care to read my comments on the very IR, you can go through the detail. Uh, so the existing levees on Sherman Island uh, would be planted with appropriate vegetation, that's habitat in and of itself. Uh, growth of tulies would be encouraged, which actually helps 
prevent fish going through, the bigger fish going through and filters out uh, uh, suspended solids. Uh, uh, so this is uh, a win-win for the water and the environment. Another reason this is a good location to take water out is that the, the water that you take is only a fraction of the flow in the rivers. You have to leave enough flow in the rivers that you've got positive flow going past ship's island. That's what's critical to the working of the estuary, which is not working so well this summer because there's not enough outflow at this point. Uh, but at Sherman Island, the amount of water you're taking of the total water is very small because there are large tidal flows. So even though the fish are not evenly distributed throughout all of the water, you're only taking a small fraction of the total water uh, and dragging it over towards these embankments that the fish can't get through anyway. Uh, and you've got these large sweeping velocities because not only do you have the river flow, but you have the tidal flow. That's getting into some technical stuff, but uh, if, if you hear people saying, but uh, Pike's an engineer and he doesn't know anything about fish, um, that's, part of that's true, but it's not entirely true. Uh, I don't know as much about fish as people like Peter Moyle, and, uh, UC Davis, but I think that's the uh, odd period of life where I'm still willing to learn. So, in summary, the Western Delta Intakes concept costs 50% less than BDCP, roughly speaking, provides twice the benefits, provides more water for export than the BDCP actually would. Uh, just Today or yesterday, Carla Miemers posted a blog based on an unsigned memo from their high-paid consultants uh, that is worth uh, uh, much less than what BDCP paid for it, uh, that says they're going to keep up exports at about the existing levels, which means, I think, like 5.5 million acre feet per year on average. That is certainly not true. If you go into the detail of, of the EIR and the plan, it's not, it's likely not possible for them to maintain that level of export unless they go to the low delta out outflow scenario, which is a non-starter with the fish agencies, even probably California wildlife, certainly a non-starter with the federal fish agency. Uh, Richard Denton, uh, formerly with Contra Costa Water District, formerly a professor at UC Berkeley, who's sort of my unpaid advisor on these things, can point to specific flaws in the BDCP calculation. The WDIC provides flood control benefits in that uh, periods of peak flow are actually helping pull water through the delta and with improved levees on Sherman Island. And although it's not part of this project, it's sort of a corollary that, that you would implement the economic sustainability plan recommendations for fat levees through the lowland part of the Delta. All of which helps retard saltwater intrusion. Uh, we increase uh, Highway 160 to four lanes at least to Rio Vista. Not everyone's crazy about increasing the width of uh, highways, but the present traffic demand on 160 up to Rio Vista and Highway 12 is so high that something has to be done. Uh, Delta residents may not particularly like it, but that traffic is going to find its way through the Delta no matter what what happens and best we get the traffic through in the safest way as we can. And best of all, the WDIC is self-regulating goes up and you're stuck in salt water. And the WDIC helps the environment. Uh, when I was trained as a young engineer in Australia, 
uh, we were taught that engineering was a balancing act between uh, economy, build it as cheap as you can, and safety. Uh, and I hate to give away my age, but that was uh, the early 1960s. Uh, the environmental movement really didn't start until 1969 with the passage of the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, and that led to both good and bad changes. It led to increasing bureaucracy, which is not good, but it did lead to recognition of the importance of the environment. So even engineers, during in the old days, now know that you've got to balance three things. Uh, build as cheaply as you can, as safely as you can, and protect the environment at the same time. So my suggested alternative does all these things for the environment. It genuinely restores more natural flows through the development. Sacramento River salmon can swim up and down the Sacramento. McCollumy River salmon can swim up and down the McCollumy. San Joaquin and tributary salmon can swim up and down without being dragged out of their natural path. It would ensure reasonable minimum outflows, better than we have at present. Uh, and there would be an automatic mechanism for enforcement. We wouldn't have to rely on uh, the State Water C C Quality Control Board, which, as those of you who follow it closely, is not a very good bunch of people to rely on when water is in short supply. Uh, the WDIC creates new habit where it's, where it's most useful at and off the western end of Sherman Island, close to the mixing zone, uh, which is the most important part of the estuary environment. At Shaded Rock Area, the habitat along Sherman Island and by extension, all other islands improves to the fat lady standard. Uh, both my throat and the audience are probably pleased to hear that almost at the end. Um, but this last uh, bullet point gives me this little opportunity to say something about the uh, levees. Uh, because this is why double levees uh, a part of an overall solution, improving double levees not only adds to the sustainability of the delver as a place, it can be positive for the environment. It's not detrimental to the environment, but positive to the environment to improve double levees. Uh, but what is the principal reason that the advocates for the BDCP give for the BDCP? Do they say it's because Metropolitan wants better water quality? Because they have to blend it with Colorado River water? Do they say it's because uh, Westlands want to be able to fill San Luis? on a more regular basis, which might be a pipe dream, but that's their hope. Uh, boy, I've got to give it to Jay Lund and Jeff Mount. Hope is not a good strategy, but that's what Westlands are relying on at present. Um, no, in the press, particularly in Southern California, the big reason for pursuing the BDCP is the threat to their water supply posed by earthquakes to double levees. And that's what that slide is saying. I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, my introductory slide, I talked about it dissolving and exploding levees. I mean, it's, as a geotechnical engineer who's testified as an expert witness in two major levy lawsuits. Uh, he studied at the knee of Harry Seed, who invented the modern study of liquefaction. He's an engineer who signed off on the last two big dams built in California, Wall Street Dam in Sonoma County and 
Seven Oaks Dam on uh, San Ramon River. To have to deal, uh, it, it's sort of a challenge. If you're educated, worked as an engineer, how do you deal with these constant press reports that talk about dissolving and exploding motors? Well, you just keep cool and plug away. Uh, but uh, you can't dismiss them because this kind of stuff is pervasive, particularly in Southern California. This, the Southern California Water Committee, which is propaganda arm of the Metropolitan Water District, pushes this relentlessly. Uh, so uh, this is where uh, it doesn't work just to pick it and demonstrate. You have to get into the substance of the argument and say, hey, uh, we're willing to talk, but let's, let's examine what you're basing your argument on. Uh, the city manager of uh, Santa Clara, uh, LA Times editorial talking about exploding levees. Uh, the term dissolving has actually been used uh, in one of these, please. Yeah, dissolve, I see it up there. Uh, so this is an op-ed in the Chronicle by the CEO of the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a business group that represents leading companies. And uh, this guy, Carl Gardino, presumably knows nothing about the facts, but he's doing his job, which is sucking up with the Santa Clara Valley Water District, because at least to some extent, the owners, managers of these big Silicon Valley companies want to have sustainable water supply and keep the rates down so that their employees and operations in Silicon Valley can thrive. That's a legitimate concern. But you can't address a legitimate concern by throwing out nonsense. Uh, uh, that, that, that might relieve someone's feelings, but it doesn't, it's not a sensible contribute, contribution to the argument. Uh, but it's not just Metropolitan and Southern California Water District. Uh, the other villains here are a bunch of university professors in my own field, uh, civil and geotechnical engineering, who like to play up the supposed vulnerability of the levy system because it gets them research grants. When I say things like this at dinner parties, uh, that people say, Robert, my friends call me wrong. Uh, you're exaggerating. And I say, no, I'm not exaggerating. I go to Washington, D.C. and serve on panels for the National Science Foundation that actually dole out money to professors for research grants. And it's a fact that unless the professor says this is a critical problem I'm working on, he doesn't get the money because he's in competition with other people that are making similar claims. So it's a fact of life that the professors have to play up the importance of what they're working on. But it would be good if they can find that to their proposals to the National Science Foundation that didn't go making statements to the press, uh, which are like grandstanding. They're grandstanding in order to support their, their research projects. And the classic example is this test done on Sherman Island by professors from UCLA, who are good guys who are friends of mine. But even after it failed to fail, they still talk about this as an illustration of the vulnerability of the Del Levy system. They keep on changing the story. First it was one thing, then it was another. Now I'm getting emails from their colleagues who are criticizing me for accusing them of grandstanding. Uh, if any of the colleagues are listening, uh, I stand by my statement. I have a low tolerance for professors who grandstand. I have high tolerance for professors that do good, solid research work. And it's not necessary to go grandstanding. Um, 
So uh, that's enough about the levy test. Uh, there is mention of that, some more detailed explanation in uh, what I call the truth about the levy system, which is the economic sustainability plan, chapters five, appendix C, D, and E, pretty heavy reading. Uh, but if any of you in the audience or anyone watching Gene's video or watching, you know, reading the, the PDF of this presentation uh, are serious about getting involved in talking about this subject, you need to go not only to the fixcawater.com website, but you also need to go to this website, uh, the uh, Pacific University Business Forecasting uh, Unit website, uh, because that until someone refutes it, which no one has done, is the, bi the current Bible on Delta Levy. Now, in spite of that, yesterday or today, the Delta Stewardship Councils put out an announcement about hiring a consultant uh, for a levy prioritization study. Uh, uh, I have nothing, no problem with the, them hiring that particular consultant, uh, in spite of the fact that there are people that fired me. <laughs> Uh, after the Delta Stewardship Council had stabbed me in the back. Uh, they're a good firm for, for undertaking that task, but I'm worried about the direction they're going to get from the Delta Stewardship Council because the announcement, instead of quoting from uh, the best document on the Delta Lady system, uh, quoted from a 2008 PPIC report Public Policy Institute report driven by the hand-waving professors from UC Davis uh, that talked about uh, uh, rigid and brittle levies. I've never heard anyone uh, suggest that the Delta levies are rigid. One of their big benefits, particularly in earthquakes, is that they're flexible. Is it a technical term? <laughs> Uh, flexibility is, is good for accommodating earthquake loads. So there are a number of reasons for believing that peat, which is the primary foundation material and constituent of many delta levees, not so much the levees up here, but lower down in the delta, uh, peat actually behaves pretty well under earthquakes. And that's all available if people want to go learn more about the facts rather than go with the hand -wave. Sir, the issue of the tunnel, uh, how is the tunnel going to solve the letter? Oh, uh, well... <coughs> how is the level tunnel going to solve the letter? The, the original concept was the tunnels which supply all the water. This was the, what was called the isolated conveyance. And uh, it doesn't solve the Delta Levy problem for anyone else, but it solves it for Metropolitan Water District. <laughs> but but even, even that argument doesn't really uh, wash anymore. Yeah, the subject abounds with water analogies. Uh, doesn't hold water, doesn't wash because they were forced to back off from this totally isolated conveyance scheme. There was clear that was not work in terms of the fish and the approval of the fish agency. So the fact that half of the water has to be through Delta conveyance. And in many, and in dry periods, it's an even greater fraction. When river flows are low, they're going to be allowed to divert less water from the North Delta. More of it will be through Delta. So the exporters are almost as vulnerable to this myth of earthquakes under BDCP as they are at present. But the truth is it's a myth uh, that the Delta Levy system has improved over the last 30 years is relatively robust for earthquakes. 
uh, earthquakes are about the last problem that the Velvet Levy system faces. Uh, extreme floods are a much greater problem, and the fact that maintenance, even regular maintenance, let alone uh, needed emergency preparedness and response at periods of high water still needs a lot of work. They have much more important issues. And uh, if Metropolitan Water District had any uh, uh, I, I'm searching for a word that sort of combines conscience and rational thinking. I'm not sure, uh, although it's a district, it's sort of run by people who like to hang on to their position of power. And rational thinking uh, uh, and uh, thinking of everyone else's concerns is not their foremost priority. Very recent example of that is that it seems that the fate of water bond in the legislature, a modified version of Lois Hawke's original bond, includes $800 million for the Delta Conservancy to spend on ecosystem restoration projects. Everyone thinks that's a good idea except the Metropolitan Water District, who is strenuously lobbying against it because they want to control how the money is spent. Uh, even on the ecosystem restoration. Now, if, if their position was it's our exports that have caused the degradation of the ecosystem and we're going to put up the money, then they might have some say in how it's spent. They might rightly have some say in how it's spent if they were putting up the money. But part of the uh, conceit here is that no, we're going to pay for the conveyance, but the ecosystem restoration benefits everyone, and therefore the public should pay for it. But even though the public pays for it, we should still control how it's spent. This, it seems to me, is a bit of a stretch. Uh, and so, I'm not the first person to point that out. That's been pointed out quite broadly by Restore the Bell to Jeff Michael and others, but uh, I'm just noting this uh, current ridiculous situation that Lois Walk and others are very aware of. Uh, Lois uh, uh, to the Delta Vision Foundation a week or two ago said that if Metropolitan get their way on control of that money for spending on ecosystem restoration, uh, that's like her line in the sand, and that she'll pull her support from from even her water bottle. So that's a big fight that's going on in the halls of the Capitol as we speak, uh, and only gets resolved when the governor decides to weigh in. That I